Well, good morning. Happy Easter. Welcome to Crossroads. My name is Phil Heller and the lead pastor here. I'd like to ask you a question. Have you ever met someone famous? Maybe turn to the person to your left or right and tell them who that person is. Some of you have told this story a hundred times by now, right? Maybe you've never washed your hands since you shook the hand of that famous person. Who is that famous person that you have met? I wonder if that famous person, when you saw them for the first time, did you know instantly, oh, that's so-and-so, or did you have to think about maybe who it was? I wonder if you could go back and rewind that moment, if you would behave differently in that moment, like you would put your words together before you open your mouth so not to make a fool of yourself in front of that famous person, right? I've had a few brushes with famous people. So I grew up with a young lady named Heather French, And that was well before she became Miss Kentucky and also Miss America 2000. Uh, When I was a youth pastor in Louisville, Kentucky, I had a young girl in our youth group whose name was Brittany, and her stepdad was Matt Bevan, and that was well before he became the governor of the great state of Kentucky. Um, Those are some of the famous people I've met. I also have sold programs for three different Super Bowls. And during those Super Bowls, I had a touch and a brush with for some people famous, like I met Shaquille O'Neal. That dude is way taller in person than he looks like on TV. His legs were crammed in this small little seat and down in uh, New Orleans for the Super Bowl. I also sold programs to Nancy Pelosi, her husband, and several members of her family who all bought several. I really appreciated that. And also got really close to Barry Sanders, the NFL great, and the former coach of the Dallas Cowboys, Jason Garrett. And I was about 15 feet away from shaking the hand of John Calipari. For a Kentucky fan, that was really a big highlight for me, right? Besides that, one other brush with somebody famous happened while my wife Christy and I were eating at a restaurant we love to go to in the Indianapolis area when we lived there. And while we were having lunch, this tall, athletic-built young man walked into the restaurant and our eyes met. And when I saw him, I thought to myself, should I know this person? And so I'll be honest, during our lunch, I was pretty distracted thinking, who is this person? Who is this person? And then it clicked. This person was someone who had recently played basketball for the Southeastern High School, Hamilton Southeastern High School, and done really well. He went on to have a career with the Michigan State Spartans on their basketball team and had just recently been drafted into the NBA when we saw him in that restaurant. His name is Gary Harris. And I've got to admit, all that information didn't come readily right to the front of my mind when I saw him. Google helped out quite a bit, like chasing some uh, rabbit trails and connecting a few dots. I was also helped by another stargazer who was sitting in the booth across the aisle from us who said to me, do you know who that is? I was like, I'm not sure. He's like, that's Gary Harris. That really helped in the Google search. Oh, (laughs) Gary Harris. Yeah, awesome. I thought that might be the last time I saw Gary, but um, actually he showed up several years later at an event at the high school where my kids all attended in Noblesville. And my son was playing for Special Olympics at that time, and Gary was a celebrity they brought back for a basketball game. It was not the fact that Gary was going or playing in the NBA at that time that really captured my attention and made it memorable. It was actually how he treated my son and the other members of the Special Olympics teams that he interacted with. He was not there as a celebrity. You could tell by his this demeanor. He was so patient and kind and gracious with the other athletes there. Here's a picture of a much younger Cade Heller and Gary Harris sporting out that event. It's a memorable moment for sure. You know, today is a day that we celebrate the greatest event of all history, the resurrection of Jesus Christ. And today we're not just here because it's a holiday. This is no ordinary day. And Jesus is not just some man who has been famous for 2,000 years. Jesus stands alone in all of human history, incomparable to anyone else. His influence and presence has been seen in all kinds of uh, sectors of our world, like healthcare and literature and art and certainly religion. His words and way of life have been considered as a way to pattern the way that we live our lives and the way that we love other people, all based on this man known as Jesus. He is the one that we seek to worship today. We are aided in our 
understanding of who Jesus is by the 2,000 years that have existed since he lived, since he died, and he came back to life. But those who lived in the first century AD, they had a disadvantage, and that disadvantage was real time. They needed some help in connecting the dots of understanding who Jesus truly was, his full identity as Messiah, as Savior, and certainly as Lord. I hope today, whether this is the first time you've ever darkened the doorstep of a church, just it's good news the walls haven't fallen in yet, right? Maybe you're here today at the invitation of a friend, a neighbor, a coworker, uh, just somebody random who extended you an invitation to join us here for worship today. Maybe you're back after a while of being disenfranchised with the church or disappointed on how life worked out. Or maybe you're here because you worship here every Sunday and you've come to celebrate Jesus with us together. I hope wherever you might find yourself on that spectrum today, that we would all see a fuller picture of who Jesus truly is and the hope and joy that he brings to our lives today. Over the past several weeks, as we've been leading up to Easter, we've been walking in the footsteps of Jesus as he made his way into Jerusalem and ultimately to the cross, a path that was marked out for him by his father. He knew the mission from the day he arrived on earth, and that was to give his life as a sacrifice for the sins of all the world. This was not something that Jesus was unaware about. He fully embraced that mission from day one. And we see Jesus humbly entering the city of Jerusalem, just willing to be who God wanted him to be, no matter what anybody else wanted or thought of him to be. We see Jesus' commitment to and surrender to this mission by the, the prayer he prayed in the Garden of Gethsemane when he said these words, Father, if there's any way possible, take this cup away from me. Yet not my will, but your will be done. We see Jesus, his resolute focus, regardless of how his closest friends, the disciples, or the religious leaders tried to oppose him, we saw him being obedient unto death, even death on the cross. And on that Friday afternoon, he took the nails into his hands and his feet for what you and I have done, the sins that you and I have committed. And on that cross, he prayed a final prayer, into your hands I commit my spirit, and then he died. After he died, the, world, the whole earth turned dark for like three hours. There was an earthquake and rocks split open. There was a veil that separated the most holy place from the rest of the temple, and it was ripped from top to bottom. And after he died, his body was taken down from that cross. It was wrapped in a linen shroud. It was placed in a tomb that was owned by a guy whose name was Joseph. He was from Arimathea. And the tomb was sealed with a huge rock. But that wasn't the end of the story. I'd like for us to hear the rest of the story today as it was told by a guy named Luke who wrote down the events of Jesus' life so that you and I could have a strong faith. We could find hope and joy in this resurrected Jesus. If you'd like to follow along in your Bible, I want to read from Luke chapter 24. It's in the first part of the New Testament. If you want to use the pew Bible in front of you, I'd encourage you to use the table of contents or somewhere around the page 800, you might find the Gospel of Luke. If you also want to follow along on the screens, the words will be there as well. Let's read what Luke has to say about this moment that changed everyone's life. Luke 24, verse 1, begins this. On the first day of the week, very early in the morning, the women took the spices they had prepared and they went to the tomb. They found the stone rolled away from the tomb, but when they entered, they did not find the body of the Lord Jesus. While they were wondering about this, suddenly two men in clothes that gleamed like lightning stood beside them. In their fright, the women bowed down their faces to the ground, but the men said to them, Why do you look for the living among the dead? He's not here. He is risen. Remember how he told you while he was still with you in Galilee, the Son of Man must be delivered over into the hands of sinners, be crucified, and on the third day raised again. Then they remembered his words. When they came back from the tomb, they told all these things to the eleven and to all the others. It was Mary Magdalene, Joanna, Mary the mother of James, and the others with them who told this to the apostles. But they did not believe the women because their words seemed to, to them like nonsense. Peter, however, got up. He ran to the tomb. Bending over, he saw the strips of linen lying by themselves. 
And he went away wondering to himself what had happened. The first people to get the news of Jesus' resurrection were some of the women who had been with him while he was being crucified. They were his followers. And they wanted to properly bury his body. So they returned to the grave early Sunday morning. They went there not to find a resurrected Jesus. They went there just to mourn the dead. But when they got there, they were surprised that the tomb was open. They went right in and they were shocked and astonished to not find Jesus' body. And as they were wondering about this, two angels appeared to them. I love the question they posed to these women, as well as the declaration they made about Jesus. They asked them, why do you look for the living among the dead? He's not here. He has risen. They reminded the women of the words of Jesus that he had told them before he died. He says, the Son of Man must be delivered over into the hands of sinners, will be crucified, and then on the third day, raised again. They immediately went to find the other followers of Jesus, including the 12 disciples and others, and they told them what they had found. But their words were not met with eager anticipation or excitement, but actually doubt. Their words seemed like nonsense, Luke says. But Peter, along with another follower named John, they booked it to the tomb. They had to see it for themselves. And when they got there, they found the same thing that the women found. I want to point out that the stone was not rolled away so that Jesus could get out of the tomb. The stone was rolled away so people like Mary and these women and the disciples could get in and see that Jesus' body was not there. He had risen, just like he said he would. I want to keep reading this moment of the resurrection from Luke 24 because we encounter some other people who were some of the first to encounter the risen Savior. Look with me in verse 13 as John write, or as Luke writes this. Now that same day, two of them were going to a village named Emmaus, about seven miles from Jerusalem. They were talking with each other about everything that had happened. And as they talked, they discussed these things with each other. Jesus himself came up and walked with them but they were kept from recognizing him. We only know the name of one of these followers of Jesus, one of these people, his name was Cleopas. He's later identified by Luke. Some scholars think that he is the husband of a woman who was named to be at the cross watching Jesus die. He's mentioned in John 19. Maybe this couple's returning back home after all that they have experienced and witnessed in Jerusalem to their home near this town named Emmaus. Whoever these two people actually are, we know that they were both followers of Jesus and they were distraught at the happenings of what Jesus had experienced. They were also bewildered at this news from the women who had been to the tomb and did not find Jesus' body there. As they traveled, Jesus himself joined them. Luke notes that they were kept from knowing his true identity by God. It seems like God was waiting for a very special moment to reveal Jesus' true identity to these two people so they could fully grasp who he is. Well, let's look how that played out. Verse 17 reads this. Jesus asked them, what are you discussing together as you walk along? They stood still, their face downcast. One of them named Clopas asked him, are you the only one visiting Jerusalem who doesn't know about the things that have happened there in these days? Jesus kind of playing along, maybe playing dumb a little bit. He says, what things, he asked. About Jesus of Nazareth, they replied. He was a prophet, powerful in word and deed before God and all the people. The chief priests and our rulers handed him over to be sentenced to death, and they crucified him. But we had hoped that he was the one who was going to redeem Israel. What's more? It's the third day since this all took place. In addition, some of our women amazed us. They went to the tomb early this morning, but they didn't find his body. They came and told us what they had seen, a vision of angels who said he was alive. Then some of our own companions went to the tomb, and they found it just as the women said, but they did not see Jesus. Jesus said to them, how foolish you are and how slow to believe all the prophets have written. Did not the Messiah have to suffer these things and then enter his glory? And beginning with Moses and all the prophets, he explained to them what was said in all the scriptures concerning himself. These two followers of Jesus, they were not misinformed or even uninformed. They were just unconvinced. 
They were slow to believe all that had been prophesied about Jesus. They failed to grasp the significance of his sacrifice and his suffering. And they did not realize that the resurrection had happened. What a powerful moment it must have been for Jesus to take these two throughout all scriptures. At that time, the books of Moses were the first five books of the Bible. Genesis, Exodus, Leviticus, Numbers, Deuteronomy. And then he walked through all the prophecies about him, pointing out that he is the point to the whole book. In fact, Jesus said that to some of the religious leaders. If you read the entire Bible and you miss me, you've missed the main point of the entire book. Every page points to Jesus and reveals his true identity as Messiah, as Savior, and also as Lord. Even though Jesus had told them many times that he would die and then come back to life, they didn't realize that it was happening just like he said it would. They were perplexed. They began wondering all about that had happened. And so Jesus walked them through exactly what had taken place and how it fulfilled all the prophecies. Jesus wanted to reveal himself to him. He wanted them to understand that God's plan for humanity was the same from the very beginning. That God wanted to be with us and us with him forever. But sin wreaked havoc in all kinds of aspects of our life. Most importantly, the relationship we had with God. Sin separated us from God. And so God did something about it. He provided a remedy for sin for all time. And that was the sacrifice of his son, Jesus. His death on the cross took our place, took our punishment. He paid our debts by what Jesus did for us. And he conquered sin through his death. He conquered death by his resurrection. And so all of that provides for us hope and joy and salvation, something we should celebrate every day of the year, not just one time a year. Jesus connected the dots for these two so that all of us could understand that he successfully accomplished the mission given to him by his Father to reconcile all humanity back to God. In verse 28, it reads this about the, these two. It says, as they approached the village to which they were going, Jesus continued on his way as if he was going further, but they urged him strongly, stay with us, for it's nearly evening. The day is almost over. So he went in and he stayed with them. And while he was at the table with them, he took bread, he gave thanks, and he broke it and began to give it to them. Then their eyes were opened and they recognized him and he disappeared from their sight. They asked each other, were our hearts not burning within us while we talked with him on the road and as he opened scriptures to us? They got up and they returned all the way back to Jerusalem at once. And there they found the 11 and those with them. They were assembled together and they were saying, it's true, the Lord has risen. He's appeared to Simon. And then these two told them what happened on the way and how Jesus was recognized by them when he broke the bread. These two people had an encounter with the risen Savior. And while at first their eyes were blinded by God himself, the, their eyes were now open so they could realize whose presence they were actually in. Some recognize this moment as a parallel with the moment Jesus fed the 5,000 people miraculously. He took bread, he broke it, and he gave it to those who were there that day. Some also so see the parallel with this moment Jesus had just spent with his disciples in the upper room where he took bread, broke it, gave thanks. It's not sure that these two people on the way to Emmaus were at either event, but in this moment, they truly understood who Jesus is. His full identity was revealed to them. I love their reaction. They said, man, did we feel something in our hearts as Jesus was talking with us on the road, as he explained the scriptures to us? I wonder if you've ever had a moment like that. Have you ever had a moment where there was a sincere desire and maybe even revelation of who Jesus was to you? I wonder if you're willing to sort through maybe some doubts that you might have right now, whether you've grown up in church all your life or not. Maybe you come today wanting desiring, maybe earnestly seeking, who is this Jesus that this whole thing is about? Well, I think from looking at these, the experience of these two people on the road to Emmaus, we can come to understand how we have hope and joy in the resurrection of Jesus and why that's worth celebrating. 
The first reason I think that that's possible and true is because Jesus fulfilled all that scripture revealed about him. When you trace the footsteps of Jesus while here on earth, what you'll recognize is that he fulfilled everything that was prophesied about him. When he was born, where he was born, how he would interact with people, the miracles he would perform, how he would die, how he would come back to life. If Jesus had not fulfilled even just one of those prophecies, then it would shed doubt on him being the full Messiah, our Savior, and certainly Lord. But because he fulfilled every single one of those prophecies, we know that God is good for his word. We know that we can take his many promises to us at face value. Jesus, fulfilling all those prophecies, shows us that he is worthy of our pursuit. He's worthy of our worship. He's worthy of our followership. Jesus fulfilled every single prophecy. Jesus did... Uh, it, Jesus stands as a powerful example for us as we place our faith and trust in the words of God himself. Peter is one of the first followers of Jesus. He's actually one of those people who experienced Jesus after his resurrection firsthand. And he writes these words. We read them earlier. Look at them again. First Peter chapter one. Peter says this. Praise be to God, the Father of our Lord Jesus Christ. In his great mercy, he's given us new birth into a living hope through the resurrection of Jesus Christ from the dead. And it's into an inheritance that can never perish, never spoil, never fade. This inheritance is kept in heaven for you, who through faith are shielded by God's power until the coming of the salvation that's ready to be revealed to you in the last time. I love this next part. Though you've not seen him, you love him. And though you do not even see him now, you believe in him and you're filled with an inexpressible and glorious joy for you're receiving the result, the end result of your faith, the salvation of your soul. Do you hear the confidence that Peter speaks of? He has seen firsthand how Jesus fulfilled the prophecies about him. He placed his trust and his followership in Jesus because of that. Because of what is true about Jesus, we have salvation, and we also have hope to live here and now. This fills us with joy because we experience peace with God and the peace of God. Another reason I think we can celebrate the joy and hope that we have in a risen Savior is because the eyewitnesses confirmed what's true about Jesus. Jesus made a bodily resurrection. And that's really hard for us to grasp, get our arms around, because it's not normal or natural for people to come back to life after they've died. There's only a few examples of that happening. Jesus resurrected some people, but guess what? They all died again, but not Jesus. Jesus died, he came back to life, and he is still living. He is reigning in heaven as our living Savior, our risen Lord. And all the eyewitnesses point to that being true. We weren't there in the first century, but we can take it on their testimony. Jesus appeared to not just his 11 closest friends. He appeared to the women who went to the tomb. Paul says he appeared to many people, even 500 people at one time. You know, it only takes a couple of eyewitnesses, two or three, to prove the evidence for something. And the evidence against, against, for Jesus' resurrection is overwhelming. We can trust it. It is true. The list of people that all encountered Jesus after his resurrection stand as witnesses to us. We can be confident in our faith because the eyewitness confirm that Jesus is alive. Why does that matter? Well, I think the next thing is this. Jesus will reveal himself to us as we seek to follow him and know him. You see, Interacting with Gary Harris just in that restaurant one day was fine. It was just a brush with somebody famous. But when we had personal interaction with him and his story intersected with our story in the life of somebody that we love, that changed the whole thing, right? That's what we see happening with these two people on their way to Emmaus. They knew the facts about Jesus, but now they encountered the risen Jesus, and that changed everything for them. I love that these two people beg Jesus to stay with them, to come into their home, to eat with them. 
It was only after that that their eyes were open and they truly understand who Jesus fully is. So the question that haunts us is like, what if they hadn't? What if they had just let Jesus continue on his way and not begged them to beg him to stay with them? They may have never come to understand fully who Jesus is. I wonder if you're willing to seek to know Jesus more, even though you might have doubts. I wonder if you're curious enough or maybe desperate enough to seek to know Jesus more. Last year, something happened that actually proved that what I've been saying for most of my life is actually true. That's a really good feeling. If you've never had that before, you should try it, okay? Here's the statement. I've always said that the redwood trees and the, the, um, the what's the other type of tree? Sequoia tree, thank you. Both of those trees, they're really tall and they're really wide. And I've always said like getting to know God it's kind of like trying to get your arms around a sequoia tree. The harder you try, the bigger you realize that that tree is. Well, last summer, we went to Northern California. We stood at the base of those redwood trees, and boy, they're tall. I tried to get my arms around a sequoia tree, and it was impossible, right? It just proved to me that the same is true about Jesus and God. The more you try to get to know him, the more you'll realize that he is so much bigger than you thought. So much more worthy of your worship. So much more worthy of your trust and your followership. The book of Acts is filled with people who actually had the opportunity to see who Jesus is, to get to know him more, and to see how his story intersected with their story. Some of those people are a woman who seemed to have everything that the good life offers her, but yet she felt hollow inside and wanted to know more about Jesus. There's another man who always felt like he was on the outside looking in and he wondered, did God's story actually include him? There was a man who was just so misguided. He thought he was headed the wrong, right direction only to realize he was headed in the opposite direction of Jesus. And then there was another man who on the very worst day of his professional life met Jesus for who he truly is. Those are just a few of the stories that the book of Acts records. And beginning next week, we want to take a walk with some of these people and look at their stories and see how God's story intersected theirs, all for the purpose of understanding how God's story includes all of us. And so we can also be equipped to tell God's story in our lives. Next week, we're beginning a new teaching series, and it's actually called, What's Your Story?, and I hope that everyone in this room will come back next week, either at 9 or 11 a.m., to join us on this journey as we get in touch with God's story in our life so that we can be equipped to share that story with others. One last thing that gives me reason to celebrate the hope and the joy that we have in this risen Savior is this, is that Jesus' resurrection fills us with hope. He fills us with joy. We get to see the contrast of these two people's life on the way to Emmaus. They were downcast and distraught at all that had happened, thinking that their hope was all lost, that Jesus, the one they placed their faith in, was dead and gone. But then after encountering the resurrected Jesus, their whole life changed. They're now filled with joy. Instead of sleeping that night, they ran all the way back to Jerusalem, seven miles so they could tell other people about Jesus who they had experienced. If Jesus' death would have been the end of the story, none of us would have hope of salvation or eternal life with God. What Jesus accomplished for us by dying on the cross and by resurrecting from the grave gives us hope and joy today, no matter what we may be walking through or dealing with. And that hope and joy is forevermore. I love what the Apostle Paul said to the Romans about all this. Look what he says in Romans chapter 5, beginning in verse 1. He says, therefore, since we've been justified through faith, we have peace with God through our Lord Jesus Christ, through whom we've gained access by faith into the grace by which we now stand. And we boast in the hope of the glory of God. Not only so, but we also glory in our sufferings because we know that suffering produces perseverance, Perseverance, character, and character, hope. And hope does not put us to shame because God's love has been poured out into our hearts through the Holy Spirit who's, given, who's been given to us. And then Paul speaks of the gospel very plainly. He says, you see, at just the right time, when we were still powerless, 
Christ died for the ungodly. Very rarely will anyone die for a righteous person, though for a good person, someone might passably dare to die. But God demonstrates his own love for us in this. While we were still sinners, Christ died for us. All that is the power of the gospel that gives us peace between us and God. Paul says it gives us power to live this life, no matter what we might be facing, because we face it with perseverance, and perseverance leads to character, and character leads to hope. Those are things that the power of the gospel can do in our life when we truly understand who Jesus fully is. But then Paul gives us how we should respond. And I like the words that Eugene Peterson paraphrased Paul's words when he said this. Look at the last section of this passage. He says, now that we're set right with God by means of the sacrificial death, the consummate blood sacrifice, there's no longer a question of being at God, odds with God in any way. If when we were at our worst, we were put on friendly terms with God by the sacrificial death of his son, now that we're at our best, just think of how our lives will expand and deepen by means of his resurrection life. Not that we have actually received, now that we've re actually received this amazing friendship with God, we're no longer content to simply say it in plodding prose. We sing and shout our praises to God through Jesus the Messiah. Paul takes us on this journey that says we have peace with God because of what Jesus accomplished for us on the cross and by resurrecting from the grave. It gives us power to live the life that we're living right now, no matter what we might be facing. No matter what we might be going through, no matter how people might feel about us, we live with power. And that power leads us to purpose. And that purpose is to give glory to God because of who he is. And fully understanding that Jesus is our Messiah, he's our Savior, and he's our Lord, we live differently. Every day that we get up, we do so with purpose to reflect the one that we say is our Savior and Lord in the way that we live and in the way that we love. My question for all of us today is this. Are you living with that kind of peace? Are you living with that kind of power? Are you living with that kind of purpose? Wherever you might be on this spectrum of faith, do you truly understand who Jesus is? Are you learning to know him more so that peace with God is possible through him and through him only? And that fills the void that's in your life that you feel right now, though you might be surrounded with everything this world offers. Maybe it gives you power to live despite what the diagnosis is. It gives you power to live despite the dysfunction that's in your family. It gives you the power to live regardless of how things are going at work or in your neighborhood or in life in general. It's because of who Jesus is, what he's accomplished for us on the cross and through the grave. It gives you purpose. Purpose that a paycheck won't ever bring to you. Purpose that all the toys in the world will not satisfy. A purpose that gets you out of bed every day with direction and joy that nothing in this world can equal or take away from you. Today, what I hope is that you truly understand who Jesus is and you'll join me on a journey of knowing him more, trying to wrap our rounds, arms around God and as a result, worshiping him more, loving him more, serving him more. That's not just something we do one time a year, something we do every day because of who Jesus is and the joy and the hope that we have in him. We celebrate that joy and hope every time we come together as a community of faith. We do that by taking a small cracker that reminds us of Jesus' life, his death, and his resurrection. It reminds us of how he lived and how he loved as an example for us to follow. And also, we take a cup of juice that reminds us of his blood that was shed for us, the sacrifice he made for us. When you came in today, you should have received a, a, a little cracker and a cup of juice. And if you made it in today and you didn't, just raise your hand real quietly. One of our ushers will bring you that as, uh, as, as I give us a moment to reflect. You know, my hope today is that you'll take these next few moments and think about, are you living at peace with God? Are you living according to the power that's available to you through the Holy Spirit? Do you have purpose in your life that transcends every day and directs your everyday activity, I'd encourage you to use these quiet moments to just remember Jesus and to think about who he truly is, who he fully is. Also, I hope that as we break bread together, this 
that you will come to know Jesus fully, that this risen Savior, you'll have an encounter with him. I'm going to pray to that end right now. Would you join me? God, I want to thank you for Jesus. Thank you for presenting him as an example of how to follow and love you. Thank you for offering him as a sacrifice in our place so that we could be forgiven of our sin. God, I want to thank you for raising him from the grave to show us your unrivaled power. God, I pray that for all of us today, we'd encounter this risen Savior, Jesus, who's Messiah, who is Savior, who is Lord of all. God, I pray that that encounter would change us. It would bring us peace with you, give us purpose and power to live with. God, I pray that you would meet us in this moment as we remember Jesus. It's in his name we pray right now. Amen.